hey everybody, it's Romania Black, and it's been literally eight days <laughs> since I've watched March Comes In Like a Lion. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I've been out of town for over a week, and it's kind of crazy. I haven't done any reactions, so this is this is the first thing I've walked back into reacting, which is so crazy, right? But I, I, I was so just devastated I had to leave home after watching episode five because it was so amazing and I was like I want to go ahead and watch episode six but I didn't have time and I was like no so I've, I've been thinking all last week I was like as soon as I get back we're gonna watch episode six because episode five of March comes in like a lion was maybe one of the best standalone little episodes that I've watched in a long time I'm a sucker for flashbacks if you know anything about me I love a flashback. I love that it gives us character development. It, it asks us questions. It makes us think about the character and how they are now versus in the flashback. And so everything we found out about Ray losing his family, getting adopted by this man, I think his name is Coda. They like, he starts to write it on the page and they cut away from it. Like they don't want us to know his full name for whatever reason, but I think it's Coda. And then Kyoda, the one, the one daughter of his that is like Ray's unknowing rival I feel like with Nikaido Nikaido is like Ray's rival he knows he's his rival he's like yes we are we're nemeses but they're secretly best friends I'm wondering if Ray and Kyoka are gonna like start out being real rivals like not friends and like is by the end of this she's gonna develop like the Cinderay crush on him I don't know poor Ray. I'd be like if that's the case I'm like she's like sun and he's like the moon it's like you could make a ship out of it but right now there's a lot of problems with it so I don't really want to ship them but at the same time I'm like I, I could see the potential there, but there's a lot that they have to communicate and work through. And our boy Ray is not the most communicative. So this is a long series. We're only on episode six of 44. So we have a long ways to go. And I'm excited at the prospect that maybe over time, Ray and Kyoko will, you know, maybe get water under the bridge. They'll talk things out. They're older now. Maybe things will be different. I don't know, but... She has a lot of things to work through, and so does he. And then we have the one brother, Ayumu, who has given up on Shogi. And then we have um, just Ray dealing with all of this alongside Akari and Hina and Momo. It was just really good. And again, this this art style, everything is just so perfect for it. It's so dramatic, and yet they insert just enough wholesomeness to it that you're like, sure, this will be perfectly fine. But before we start, I've got some comments from episodes three through five since I've had time to look at them <laughs> while I've been gone. And I also want to point out, this is the end card for episode five. Uh, Pancake shared it in the Discord. Um, it gives such Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland vibes. I'm kind of all about it. Um, it's by uh, Yuko Higuchi, who um, has done other pieces of work. So I'll show you one that Pancake shared here in a second. But it just looks like Alice in Wonderland. If you've ever seen, I have like one of the copies of the Alice in Wonderland when it first came out. I love Alice in Wonderland and the style, like the big exaggerated eyes and it looks kind of hyper realistic, but then it also doesn't look realistic. There's a specific art style. It's like late 1800s that this feels like it's tapping into like European 1800s. Um, I love it. And I'm also creeped out by it to no end. <laughs> So it's really super cute. I feel like this is something that should be in Magica Madoka, which is another series I've just started. I feel like this belongs over there <laughs> in terms of the art style. But Pancake also shared another piece of art that they did that they do have this kind of like just Alice in Wonderland kind of vibe to it. And it's just very cutesy, but also has this kind of hyper real creepiness to it. And I'm all about it. And I love it. So so thank you for sharing that. That's really cool to uh, to note for this. As far as comments go, um, Shimoyama pointed out that in episode three, in the Japanese subtitles, there was a correction that the butler called the woman who's getting on the cruise the great mistress. So Shimoyama's like, we don't exactly know if this is Nikaido's mom or his grandma that is going on the cruise. So that would add another layer to it if Nikaido's parents are dead and he's being raised by his grandparents and the butler and they're elderly. So they're like, butler, take care of our grandchild. And it would make more sense as to why Nikaido, who has a illness, is being kind of neglected. And I'm like, but you're their parents. But if they're grandparents, 
it adds another layer, another barrier there in between there. So that would make a lot of sense. So thank you for pointing that out. And also the model for Nikaido is actually a real life shogi player named Sutoshi Murayama. And uh, Shimayama did not want to go into details about the live action shogi player that Nikaido is based off of for reasons because of spoilers. So thank you. But they did note that there was a live action film based on them called Satoshi, a move for to a movie for tomorrow. I might look into that when I'm done with March comes in like a lion, but obviously I don't want to watch it right now for spoiler reasons, but thank you. Um, Sarah S pointed out a couple things about the storyboard artists for the last couple of episodes. Um, if you look at their, uh, comment for episodes three and episodes four, there's a lot of detail there. So I'm just going to skim over the, the noteworthy parts for me, but, um, I thought it was interesting that the storyboard artist for episode two was Kenichi Imaizumi, who, um, did episodes of Hunter Hunter, um, Etsuko Sunimoto, who did episode one, uh, through three of old Full Metal Alchemist, which was interesting. And then Mayu Fujimoto, who has done Demon Slayer and Bleach, which is really cool. And then they noted in episode four, the animation was directed by Nana Miura. And I'm like, is there a relation to Berserk? But probably not. Um, they did do episode one of season three of Mob Psycho, though, which I love. So I was really excited about that. And then Yasuko Miyazaki did the key animation. And they've also worked on Attack on Titan, Case Study of Toss, Run with the Wind, Great Pretender, Mob Psycho Season 3, lots of others. So if you get a chance, go to Sarah's comment on Episodes 3 and 4. They talk about a lot of cool animation people that are behind the scenes working on this series, which is super exciting. And um, speaking of which, I Swallow Apple Seeds point out in Episode 4 that it was directed by Tomoyuki Itamura, who also directed the case study of Vanitas. And I was like, cool, I've seen that series. It was really good. That's really exciting. Um, the last two comments I have, one is from a scary purple ampersand. They pointed out that if you're just playing Shogi recreationally, because I did ask this in episode five, I was like, do they time these all the time? And they're like, no, in recreational Shogi, there is no timing. It's like if you're playing chess, but to keep the games moving at a relatively controlled pace, they do do a timer for professional Shogi matches. And I was like, that makes a lot of sense. So thank you. And finally, uh, Death to Boredom pointed out that um, because I really liked what Death to, Bo Death to Boredom said in their episode five comment, talking about how it it's like you had Ray's dad who had been a professional shogi player, but gave it up. So him playing with Ray was more recreational and it was, you know, Ray connecting with his father on this like really deep level just through playing shogi for fun. And then you have Koda, his foster father, who takes him in and they play Shogi. So it's like, it's mimicking that, but the same wholesome deep connections, not there. It can't be there because Koda is a professional Shogi player. And the only way to play him is on a professional level. So you don't get that same quality of connection like Ray did with his biological dad. And I thought that was really, really interesting to point out this concept of there's no enjoyment in playing shogi professionally with the kids because it's all just about the money. And I was like, hashtag capitalism, <laughs> hashtag capitalism, uh, destroying the enjoyment of many things. And I thought that really related to a lot of things. You know, it relates to real life of, do you get to enjoy something once there's capitalism tied to it? And, you know, I, I've talked on my own channel being like, everybody's like, oh, you should take a week off. And I'm like, yeah but then I'm gonna be behind. And it, this is kind of like a side business now and I have bills to pay with it. And I, I have services I, I pay for that if I don't have the patrons, I can't pay for it and then I can't do it. And so it becomes the cycle and, and I enjoy it. Don't get me wrong. I'm loving watching this series. I'm getting to talk to you, which is amazing, but there is a business angle to it now. And it's like, I, it doesn't hurt my enjoyment of it, but I've been on other channels and talked to other reactors and seen where they have had issues of burnout and things like that because it was no longer just enjoying it. There came that professional tie to it that limited that. And so it does not escape me that that little symbolism and comment is a thread line in this and it can relate to us in real life as well. And that's not just for me or reactors to channels, that's for anything, right? Once there gets to be a, a, a burden of capitalism placed on it, then, you know, you kind of have to question, do you really like doing this? Or is there some other ulterior 
reason you're doing it. And for me, I like doing it. So I'm lucky in that regard. I don't have to rely upon this to eat, which is good, right? Some people do. And that's when it gets to be an even bigger stressor. So I feel as if I've talked enough. <laughs> 10 minutes is good enough. So I'm excited to start episode six, y'all. I hope you all are too, but we're not going to waste any more time. We're going to dive right into episode six of March comes in like a lion. And we're going to do that here in three, two, one, and let's uh, go. So yeah, uh, wanted to bring my Coon out <laughs> because damn, this series, it's like, this series is like, did you need a therapy session? Did you need a therapy session in 23 minutes? Or if not a therapy session, did you need someone to sit down and tell you things about yourself that you've been thinking about subconsciously and it just brings it to the forefront of your existence? And you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I really love this series so much because of just how like subtle it is. It's so, it, at times the animation and the dramatic like head turns are so like, this series, every time like a character is about to like go through an emotional experience, it's like, whoosh, like the head turns very dramatically, but it's never, it's never done in a way that, that feels gimmicky. It doesn't ever feel like it's too much. It just, it's an aesthetic. It's an aesthetic to the show. And I'm like, I'm here for it. So I don't know exactly what to do about that, but. I brought White Word Coon out because there was some shogi stuff talked about, and I want to probably write that on the board, but but going through this episode and just kind of getting an idea of what's going on. And so I the thing about Ray that is so interesting is that Ray Ray believes they're not I feel like Ray likes to believe that they're very closed off and hard to read, but the reality is a lot of people a lot of people can read Ray, but they're not exactly sure what's going on. So they're just like, I know something's wrong, but I don't know what to do about it. So I'm just going to kind of like be there for Ray and be supportive. And that's really, really great. But so Ray is in a slump. That is where he is right now. He's in a slump and he's not advancing like he feels that he should be. So um, my question is, I guess at this point, he says, I want to go somewhere. And they're eating various things. They're eating like, um, it shows them eating, it looks like oranges or pumpkin or something. I love that the cats, the cats are just like slowly trying to, they're, they're always in the background trying to eat the food, which is hilarious to me. It's really super cute. But I, I like the idea of where we have, we have the three sisters, right? So we have Momo. Momo just wants to get potatoes. <laughs> Momo just wants to go dig for potatoes. She's she's the most simple childlike of the bunch. She doesn't really have any place she wants to go. She is the least the least traumatized, the least burdened by adulthood. She wants to just go dig potatoes, and the grandpa's like, "Well, child labor it is." No, but the grandpa, speaking of which, he wants to go to a shrine. That's where he wants to go to, and it connects back to his wife that he's lost, right? Um, he's getting the free run treatment over here. He's wanting to go and uh, visit a place that she's that she never got to, right? And so that kind of connects to his character wanting to, like, you know, have closure, right? So I guess with Momo, she's just a kid. So her thing is just exploration, right? It's exploration of a child. It's that childlike curiosity. She's just trying to explore, and she's just a kid. She's not burdened with any existential dread. Uh, the grandpa, meanwhile, is trying to gain closure. He wants to go to the shrine that his wife couldn't visit, and he can get closure there. Then you have Hina, who I like Hina's character a lot. Hina is the quintessential middle school girl. She has a crush. She doesn't know what to do with her emotions. She clearly has very, very, you know deep and extreme emotions as Ray is able to notice, but she is very indulgent. So we have Hina. She wants to go to like an amusement park or a restaurant. She wants that indulgence. She wants things. She's in middle school. She wants to experience things and go and have like the finer things in life. Can't blame her. And then you have Akari. Akari, I, I love that Akari, who's our very maternal character of all of this, Akari just wants to relax. She wants a relax and a massage. She wants some peace. 
from all the work that she does working at the shop, working at the bar, cooking for the family. She wants some time. I, I never really understood growing up why my mother and her friends who were also mothers wanted to just go to the beach. It's such a crazy thing, but they all just want to go to the beach. And when you go to the beach with a mother, stereotypically um, where I'm from, they just want to sit on the beach. They don't want to do anything. There's no schedule. There's no obligations. They're like, I'm going to sit here with my book and nobody's going to bother me. And I'm going to get my me time and I'm going to read. And as a kid growing up, I never really understood why that was. I was like, well, why does they want to do that? And then I'm like, wait, they're a mom. Their whole entire day is spent doing things for other people. They don't have time to do things for themselves. So this is like their me time that they just get on the beach not doing anything with no one telling them what to do and no obligations that they get to have for themselves. And so for Akari to want that, it all makes sense. And then, of course, everyone there is like, thank you for doing everything for us. And she's like, good on you. But then it's like, why does Ray want to go somewhere? And he's like, I don't really have a place I want to go. I don't know a particular place I want to go. I just want to go somewhere else. So Ray in his slump just wants to go somewhere. He hates stagnation and where he's at. He hates being stagnated, which is kind of the big thing about this episode. He hates the idea of the stagnation and this complacency that he's developed with himself around Shogi, but he doesn't know what to do. And so he's kind of stuck in this rut and he just wants to leave it and go somewhere else, but he doesn't really know why or where or to what extent going somewhere will help him. So then we have the teacher, which I will say the, the voice actor for the teacher, he plays Reagan in Mob Psycho. Um, he also plays Ghetto in Jujutsu Kaisen. He hides his voice really well. I feel like when he plays Ghetto or Reagan, I can tell his voice actor. But here he kind of like subdues it a little bit. Um, he also plays Miyuki on Ace of the Diamond. I feel like in those roles, his voice is a little bit more exaggerated. Maybe because he's trying to be an older teacher here. He's kind of like restraining it a little bit to make himself sound older. It's interesting. But yeah, so they mark, he's like, look, you're kind of absent a lot. You're going to miss these exams that are kind of important, um, but you're a professional, so I guess we can't mark you truly off from it. You, you can't miss a match. So they establish this idea that you cannot forfeit a match. Th this is kind of insane to me. You cannot unless it's for a funeral. That is extreme. That's very extreme. You can't, even if you're sick, you can't go to a match. You can't miss a match. So to me, that is setting up one of two things because Ray's parents have already died. So he can't, that, that idea of missing a match because of the funeral of his parents, that's not going to happen. So it's, to me, it's suggesting like one of two things may happen in the future. If we're going to go for maximum, <laughs> maximum melodramatic effect, one is that I wonder about Nikaido if like he's going to get sick and he can't forfeit a match because of his illness, but he doesn't tell anybody about his illness except for the butler. So what if him and Ray get in a match and his illness acts up and he's like, I can't forfeit. I have to go through with it. Then what do we do? Um, the other thing is I wonder with Kyoko, what if something happens to Koda? What if something happens to the foster dad? And she like, could forfeit a match or not. I will talk about Kyoko in a minute, but I, I feel like this knowledge that you can't forfeit a match unless it's the funeral of one's parents is going to be something. This piece of information is going to be something that comes up later on in the series. We just don't know how or why yet, but so in any case, the teacher's like, look, you can miss this study camp, but it's a major event in your life that you're missing out as a student. And Ray's like, I was disappointed, but it wasn't that I was disappointed that I couldn't go, but that I was relieved for not being able to go. So I like that Ray points out that the study camp that is supposed to be this like childhood, like, you know, childhood adolescent event that he's relieved he doesn't have to go. And I can definitely see, like, 
how Ray feels in that regard because it's one of those things like there are certain events in high school that you're expected to do. And I remember like one was this certain dance that everybody is expected to go to your sophomore year, your second year, everybody's supposed to go to this dance. It's a big thing, but I didn't want to go. I was like, I didn't want to go. And I was like, I didn't like anybody there. And I was like, I don't dance. And so I was like, this is going to be so awkward and weird. I don't like any of this. And so I tried to find any excuse not to go. And I kind of like in hindsight, I don't regret not going, but I did feel kind of like disappointed that I was happy. I wasn't attending this like event. Everyone else was excited to go to. So I can understand why Ray is like, and plus for Ray, it's compounding with the fact that he is actively trying to be a professional chogi player to have independence but the sacrifice of that is that he's missing out on his childhood. So it's like, there's this sacrifice, right? We'll put up here. It's like being this shogi player. On the one hand, you have independence. We kind of did one of these uh, last week. You have independence from the family. But on the other hand, you don't get to experience high school things. But otherwise, you don't have the independence. So it's like, it, it, it's this cycle. And as much as Ray wants to admit that he's just, my thing is Ray has not come to terms with the fact that does he like Shogi or not? Because from the last episode, it seems like he doesn't, he didn't like Shogi. He just did it to connect with his father. And then he did it to have a home away from an orphanage. And now he's doing it professionally to get independence and save the foster family that saved him. But I think that the underlying thing is, part of this series is talking about growing up and how we change. I think that at some point Ray may come to terms with the fact that he does like Shogi and he's playing it because he enjoys it, but he doesn't have a reason or a desire. He's not, again, we talked about like the Scott Pilgrim, like do it for self love. He doesn't have that yet. So it's kind of like, ugh. he's like, still don't give me that face of relief. The teacher's like, really? Are you, come on now. I do think that there's times in this where Ray looks really good and I'm like, no, he's a high school student. Get away. But there are times where Ray looks really good. And I could see like when he grows up, um, we'll talk about Toya or Toji, Toya Shoya, Toji Shoya, which is the, the child of God. Right. I feel like, you know, they talk about him not looking any different than he did for middle school. I feel like Ray's going to be one of those as he grows up, he's not going to look that different. I'm like, part of me wants to see Ray all grown up, but the other part of me is like, let's get through this first. I like the teacher just doesn't cut mince words. He's very direct. He's like, yeah, he's like, you don't have a lot of free time. It's, it's just like any other sport. When you're not on the clock, you train, you study. And I like that as the, the square gets smaller and smaller, as it shows kind of like how Ray's world gets enveloped. So there's this idea of free time. And that free time is devoted to studying. And I was curious if they like went over statistics or scoreboards or things, but he's like, yeah, we go over, we play games to train. We play with others. We do studying. We look at all of the old rule books. We just, we try to like strategize. It's like, that's just part of it. And that's when the teacher's like, well, then why did you re-enroll in high school? And I think that the answer is to have some sense of, to like try to have some sense of normalcy, but also to go back to Kyoko, who is like, what does she say here? We, we dive back to Kyoko. She's like the water, right? She says, you don't have a home. You don't have a family. I like that in all the flashbacks of Kyoko that we see, she has like the cross necklace, which we talk about child of God. It's like, there's like a spirituality tied to all this. She's like, you don't have a home. You don't have a family, which is so mind boggling to me because he does technically have a home. He has a place to live. He does technically have a found family in the three sisters and the grandpa that have taken him in along with his friend, Nikaido. So he technically has a family and she's like, and you don't go to school. And so, and then she's like, you don't have any friends. There's no place for you in this world. And it's just her, this like tempest, this human tempest, just coming in and telling him what he has and doesn't have. And I'm like, so then Ray's thing is that he has created this. He has a found family. He has a home. He's going to school. He's trying to basically, 
it's he doesn't quite say it, but he, it's almost like he's like I wanted to show her she was wrong, and she's wrong because of these. Because if he has a home, a family, and he goes to school, then there's a place for him. But the funny thing is, at home there's nothing there. It's bare. The family that he has, he doesn't he hasn't quite fully connected with, and the school he doesn't want to attend. So when she says there's no place for you in this world, it does kind of like hit him pretty hard because he's like yeah I'm just kind of faking it right now but is it weird that I kind of I kind of want to ship Ray and Kyoko is it weird but here's the thing I don't ship them now I don't ship them now but I want to ship them by the end of the series I want them to develop a relationship and I want to be able to ship them by the end of the series because I think she's just majorly Sundere but I want to get to that point first we'll see how it develops and I like that he says he wasn't angry or sad at her words, but they just like stuck to him because they were real. And he got that. He was like, ooh, this is the reality of the situation. I see how that is. And he's like, that's why I wanted to become a professional. And we see him like struggling over the clock. Like he's only got eight minutes left and whoever he's facing has 19 minutes. So he's running out of time. And he's like, I thought if I could support myself without any help, that would become the place where I belong. And there's the problem. The problem is he says without anyone's help. But the thing that Ray needs to learn is that you need help. Everybody needs help. You can, it's so hard to do it on your own. And it's exhausting to do it on your own. That, you know, it's that idea of are you too proud to accept someone's assistance. And I think that Ray wants to be proud and he doesn't want to have anybody's help, but it's like, you, you've got to get people's help. That, that's how this works. You can't just do this on your own. And so it talks about how he did become a professional shogi player. And for like a year, he was able to move out and get a place quickly. And the idea of him like getting his name on everything, suddenly... That all makes sense. Like episode one where his name was creepily on all of the advertisements, he instantly rose to fame and now it makes sense. And it makes sense because he's the fifth middle schooler to go pro. Now, obviously, Toji uh, Shoya is one of them. I'm going to say that Koda, the foster dad, is another one. The question is, was his father, Ray's dad, one of them? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I definitely think that Shoya and Koda were two of the middle school ones that went professional. We don't know about the other two. And then Ray is the fifth. Which, no big deal. No big deal. Don't Ray just, you know, is having an existential crisis and is constantly depressed. Let's just add another layer of stress on him by having people expect him to be the next prodigy because the four that did become professionals in middle school all became masters. Let's just give him another layer of expectations. I, this show, the deeper we get into it, the more I feel I understand why Ray is so depressed all the time because of all these expectations that he has that he's not, he's like, I'm not even that interested in this game. I'm just doing it for reasons. And it's like, oh my God. But he's like, it was like my battery had ran out. I like the idea he talks about, you know, in a room without curtains or a TV, my battery ran out. And then he talks about like when he first moved in there and the idea that he would just sleep away his days. And we tie it back to the OP where it feels like he's drowning. And then I loved this description. He's like, in my previous home, I would help out with chores and so I continued it more or less, but on my own, it was to the point where if you're doing it for yourself, it's just a hassle to even cook some rice. I was like, oh my God, yes. Because when you're in a home, like when I was growing up living with my family, you do chores and you do all this stuff, but you're all working together as this community and everyone's doing just a little bit of, of the thing. So it never felt overwhelming. You were all working towards a common goal, but you were doing it together. So it was all split up. Here, he's doing everything by himself. So he has no motivation. There's no camaraderie. There's no doing it together. There's none of that. So he doesn't have any motivation to do it. Which makes so much sense. It's like, yeah, that's exactly how this goes. It's kind of wild. And he's like, so I just didn't make food for myself. And I just, you know, was starving. 
And it's so relatable. It's like, no, that all makes sense. So he's like, basically explains how this works. He says they're currently, he's like, I moved forward and saved the money I had. And so of course his like frown gets deeper and deeper throughout this. So it talks about there are, oh, there are currently 30 people in rank C1. So C1, there are 30 people. That's not a lot in the country of Japan. That's not a lot. They face off against 10 opponents in the class. Mm. And the two people with the most wins can advance. So the two of the 30 advance to B2. There are all these ranks. And I feel like we're going to learn about them as we go. And advancing requires all wins or the closest to it. Yeah. And then he talks about how he was doing good. And in his second year, he started to lose. He lost two matches in a row for the first time. Hmm. And then I sat there dumbfounded. And he's just like, I lost my chance at advancement. So yeah, he talks about how he's not gotten to this point yet. He's still there at C1. And he's at this point of stagnation. And I like how he talks about the complacency of stagnation. The complacency of just being okay. And now it's represented by a big red C. And the way it's like your lifeblood almost is being represented in that C. And the way he talks about that you swim and you swim and you swim. You work so hard to get to this one place. So it's like, he's like, I have swam all this way to get to this rank of C1. And he's like, I'm at the top 30. I, I don't have to move forward. I could just stay here. He's like, I did all of this work to get here. He's like, and that was the checkpoint that I had to get you to be a professional. But he's like, up here, there's even more storms. And I like, they have the lightning and everything like shown off. And then here's like the B2 rank. And he's like, I can keep working and I can keep trying, but how long is this going to take? And what if I can't make it? What if I'm not good enough? What if I don't have the drive that these other people have to make it there? And that's when we find out about him getting those rankings and those people, you know, being like, well, I thought you were a prodigy. Were you just full of ego? And he's like, no, I'm just suffering and in depression, <laughs> you know? Uh, Ray looks so good without his glasses on. Just by the way, his green eyes, he looks so good. And I'm like, dang it. Poor Ray. I feel for him. He's like, I just wanted to get somewhere and feel complacent. He's like, if I accepted it, as long as I stopped thinking, then I reached my goal. He's like, I didn't have a single reason anymore to plunge back into the stormy sea and head for the next island. He's like, it's like, I don't have a motivation beyond this point. I just need to become a professional so I can sustain myself and get out of that house. And I've done my goal. So if I just accept this, I don't have to work towards anything else. But that's when he talks about the snow and meeting Toji. Now I met Toji when he was a kid. We don't exactly know the reasons why or how. I'm assuming He's outside waiting on his dad, maybe, and maybe Toji is going to see. What I don't know is, is he waiting? What we don't know at this point is in the flashback with the snow with Toji, if Ray was waiting with his biological dad or if his family passed and now he's been adopted at this point. We don't know that yet. I'm kind of leaning more towards he'd been adopted at this point and maybe Shoya was going to face Koda. Maybe their rivals. He's so handsome with the silver hair, but he also looks so, he looks like Ray. He just looks kind of glum. And like, this is all he does is just play Shogi to live. I want more, I want more with Toji and Ray. Cause I want to know like, cause Toji seems more like Ray than Koda does. You have Koda and Kyoko and you have Ray and maybe this guy. And they're kind of like showing how maybe they're similar and different. I want more with him. Cause he seems a lot like Ray. Interesting. He was the child of God. And that's when the teacher brings up the magazine that has him featured. And so then he talks about Takashi. Takashi has intermediate level and he, he like sets up the shogi board 
And he's like, oh, yeah, that's really cool. And he's like, you set it up very neatly. And so then he explains the different positions. Okay, so there's three A, B, and C, okay? So there is, just like in chess, there is a bishop. There is a king, which in chess there's only one king. Then there's gold. Dragon horse. I'm like, what is a dragon horse? I think that's pretty cool. And then I know there's like generals and things like this. So he goes through the, the setup of the board and then he shows how they all could move to checkmate someone in a matter of like three moves. Yeah. 13 moves checkmate. And then he's like, easy peasy. And the teacher's like, that took me weeks. That took me so long to set it up. I love how dramatic it is where it's just like, that took me so long to set up. And it's just like, I could just imagine this in the manga. Insane. He's like, well, that's why you're a professional. Hmm. And that's when he mentions Toji, who apparently Takahashi went to school with. They're like, he's doing great this season. He's defended his Kishin, Seiryu, and King titles. So he's got three major titles. Like, he's the Bobby Fischer. He's the one to beat in the in the shogi world. I can't imagine who our rival is going to be. Ha! Huh? I can't imagine! I thought it was going to be the Foster Dad, but it might be, it might be uh, Toji. And they don't really know what he's like. And he's like, I've heard of him, but I've never professionally met him. And then there's a special match move room. Where he's like, we're in dis different ranks and he holds most of the titles. And even at tournaments, I rarely see him. I love that there's this like snow white aura around Toji. He's just like, so like a lotus blossom in the snow. He's just like pure white. Interesting. Which is, there's such a calm. I also like the, the way that Toji kind of has the snow and the blanket of cold calm around him. Whereas Ray is this giant flustered tempest of a storm. Interesting. Very interesting. And he says he hasn't changed since he was a teenager. Time has stopped for him. And that's when they talk about the middle school professionals. Yeah. Which I feel so bad for Ray that he's just being targeted. And when the teacher says he's amazing and those guys like meet him outside the elevator, what sucks is that Ray's a kid and all of these adult figures, like, like his spectrum of adult relationship and communication ranges so much from like Akari and the grandpa who are so kind to Issa and Smith who are like fellow comrades, colleagues, but they're still like kind of goofy and professional to these assholes that are like, well, why aren't you a master yet? To like the, the foster dad, like his, his Ray, when Hina says acts like a mature adult, it's like, yeah, cause he's around these adults all the time and he has all these relationships with them. It's no wonder he's like that. Right. But I, I love when he was like telling the teacher, he goes, no, I'm not, I'm not amazing. I'm having this slump. And I like how it goes from the two men saying, oh, well, even prodigies have slumps to being like, well, why aren't you getting better? Like that's expected. Like you have something to uphold. Again, all the pressure that he has on him is insane. It's just insane. And then he says, I'm not amazing. And the teacher's like, Oh, I feel like the teacher knows in that moment exactly what's going on. He tries to like use the, the pork cutlet to like cut through and have some humor, but it's like, you know, he kind of gets it and he says, well, maybe you're not amazing, but you need to win from yourself. You need to beat yourself. You need to get to where you're. Yeah. And of course, Ray thinks it's referring to his defeats. And I think the teacher's like, no, you need to win for yourself. You know, you need to figure out why are you doing this? What is, what is your purpose in playing Shogi? And he's like, man, he's like, you're, you know, trying to balance school and all this. That's really hard. And whenever Ray gets like that thin smile or he's like, wow, thanks. You could sugarcoat that a little bit. I love when Ray has like the thin smile. Cause it's so see-through. It's just so obvious that he's just being sarcastic and he's like you didn't come back to high school because you wanted to study i love that shot of him in the foyer looking up and the lights reflecting it's so beautiful he's like then why did you come back and they both kind of know like you know so in november he lost his third match and he's like, I felt like I've swallowed in black ink. And I love that the color black keeps following Ray around. Like it just surrounds him and the storm, everything. 
And that's when he finds Hina. And I like also the contrast of Ray being enveloped in like shadows and darkness, which is kind of echoing what he's feeling at the moment and where his emotional state is. And then you have Hina who is just like bright colors and beautiful rainbows and stars and twinkles. And she's so animated and it's such a contrast, right? Now I don't ship Ray and Hina at all, but I feel like they're very much like siblings where he offers to like buy her the, the milkshake with a hundred yen. She's like, Oh really? And she's so grateful that he buys her the shake and I love she's like, it's the first time she's being treated by a guy and she like gets a good thing that Ray bought her the shake first, because if that baseball boy had bought her something first, she would have spontaneously combusted. <laughs> right. And she's, I love when she looks over to him and he's just kind of like distantly looking off with the coffee. I, again, Ray looks so good there, but she realizes something's wrong. Ray's not very good at hiding it. He thinks he is. He thinks nobody understands what he's going through, but even Hina notices that there's something wrong and she's concerned about him and i love that akari akari whenever hina's like he's not come over lately and akari's like you know sometimes people go through a slump and just let them work it out we'll let them work it out a little bit more before we reach out to him i love that she likes to give ray his space to figure out what to do and then and then go from there but yeah but Hina, you know, Hina is not as experienced or as old as Akari. So even though her sister says, give him some space, she's like, but I want to help him now. So she tries to offer him, like, the shake to make him feel better. And she's like, you're always quiet and mature like an adult. But he cries, and so I worry about him. She's like, even though he's an adult, he still needs help sometimes. And she's like, let's come over and eat dinner together. And she's like, I still want him to know he's welcome, right? I feel like even though Akari was trying to do good... In giving him some space, Ray needed to hear from someone that he belongs somewhere. Because it's like when the teacher was like, "Why do you keep coming to school?" It's almost as if Ray is like, "Well, I want to, I want to prove I, have, I belong here. I have a space." But the teacher's like, "But you don't. You don't want to do anything with the students, and you're just kind of like pseudo being here to say that you are." But what's the point? So I feel like Hina telling him he can come to her house is giving him that answer that he needs, that he does belong somewhere. Right. So then we have the scene afterwards where he's like, man, he's like, I'm pathetic. Hina's so level headed and she's worrying about me while she's in middle school. And then he like, you know, of course, Ray can't just accept the compliment, accept the kindness and just be like, oh, yeah, I belong here. No. Instead, he has to make it, you know, existential dread <laughs> and go, man, she's like caring, considerate. And Akari's working three jobs and she still finds time to help her family. And they're all thinking of other people and. I'm just over here thinking of myself, so why am I such a burden? And I'm like, Ray, you're not a burden. <laughs> ah, I just, I hate how depressed he is. And I want to just give him a hug and be like, you've got to stop thinking like that. But easier said than done, right? But he's just like, why am I just having my own problems? I'm so pathetic. And she's like, why are you being like that? But then I thought, you know, maybe she was blushing at Ray, but no. It's the very tall ace of the diamond, like middle schooler behind her who's like already six foot two. And she like freaks out. Yeah, that she has a crush on. And I like that Ray tries for a second to be like, oh, hey, I'm going to go. You guys can talk. This is your crush. Like he tries to be a wingman for a hot second. And then he like, oh, no, 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 you cannot leave. You cannot leave. It will be awkward. I don't know what to say to this guy. I don't want to embarrass myself. And I thought for a second that Ray would just like awkwardly sit there while they had a conversation, but Hina can't take it. She's like, I gotta go. And in that moment, she grabs his like coat to make him stay. She looks so young and she looks so much like a little middle schooler there. Like she doesn't look like a high, like a 13 year old girl. She looks like she's 10 and she's like, I can't do this. And I love how young they make her look there. And then she just can't talk. So she has to go. And I like that the guy sits down with Ray and just stares at him. And he's like, well, I love Ray's just like, I don't know what to say to him. I don't know why I'm here. This is so freaking awkward. Uh, what I was going to say is that, you know, the, the, the ace baseball player that he knows a crush on, he just sits down and he's like, so normally these sports anime are BL. So <laughs> are, are we like, is this going to be a thing? And Ray's like, no. Oh my God. 
hilarious. And the way that he just does the stare, I swear it's like Yuri on Ice where the triplets are staring. It, it's exactly like Yuri on Ice. Even like the way that stare is enunciated. Oh my god. Insane. So yeah, this episode was really, really good. I, again, March doesn't miss. March doesn't miss. And I freaking love this series so far. I want to give Ray the biggest hug. Oh my God, what do we do? So here's to us hoping that Ray gets out of his slump and manages to start winning again. But this seems like a two-parter. So even though we got chapters one and two of Child of God, next week it feels like we're going to start the third chapter, maybe a fourth. So... We'll just see what happens then. But in any case, I hope y'all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe. Take care. And yeah, I'll be back real soon with more March Comes In Like a Lion. Cheers. Bye.